Welcome to another edition of Counterpoint Conversations. My name is Gareth Thorin and I'm Associate Director at Counterpoint. With me today is Mark Kumili, who's VP Technology for Custom Cloud Solutions at Marbell. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Gareth. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you today. So today we are going to have a chat about Marvel's custom silicon business. Um, but before, before we start, I just wondered, Mark, if you'd like to say a few words about your uh, role at Marvel as VP for Custom Cloud Solutions. It, sure. Uh, so I essentially lead our architecture for custom cloud solutions, which means that I spend a lot of my time uh, working with our uh, big data center customers, the hyperscalers, to define what solutions are going to fit into their next generation systems. And also work a lot within Marvell to basically make sure that we've got the technologies that our customers are going to need years ahead of time so that we're ready for them uh, with the latest cutting edge technologies that uh, that they're going to need in the future. Okay, thanks for that. So Custom Silicon is one of the big drivers behind the growth in Marvell's data center business. And your data center revenues grew 73% year on year in the first fiscal quarter. That's more than $1.4 billion. Um, but over the past 50 years or so, the semis industries has tried by producing chips that could be adopted across an open ecosystem. And standards has very much been a part of that. So, so why this shift to, to custom? Uh, sure. Um, so I'd say a big part of the shift to custom is really driven by scale, right? Uh, uh, years and years ago, uh, data centers didn't really have the scale that they do today. Um, with that scale, you know, the growing larger and larger, the data centers have started to see that there's really unique pinch points that are created um, that are really impacting their overall performance. Uh, so that's really one it one one issue that's a part of it. Another thing that we're seeing as well along with that increase of scale in the data center is another kind of scaling, which is really the slowing of silicon scaling. It means that uh, really to get the performance increases that we need generation to generation, that we used to get almost entirely from technology, we need more and more silicon to do the same job today. That makes the devices bigger, makes them more expensive. And if you're a big data center customer and you've got this huge data center, you want to make sure that those big investments that you're making are really optimizing the functions that you need to optimize, right? You really want to make sure that if you're going to make a, a big investment, uh, whether it was to buy standard components or to build your own, that you're actually addressing the key pinch points that you see in, in your data center. And quite frankly, when you build a general purpose device, that super set of features is impossibly inefficient when the technology is scaling, um, you know, so slowly as we've seen in the last several years. You know, right now at Marvell, we forecast that about 25% uh, of compute silicon is going to be custom uh, by 2028. And quite frankly, most of the projects we're seeing for major chips like XPUs uh, on advanced technology are custom because of those needs. It's really even, you know, we can, I think we can all agree probably customization for those XPUs is, is important and necessary to, because they do have very different workloads and different data centers. But we're even seeing it going beyond XPUs. Uh, so, for example, we did a custom NIC with Meta uh, that we announced. Um, and we also announced the ability at Marvell to customize switches. Um, so we're seeing customization really expanding beyond just processors and even going to the point of custom platforms where, uh, you know, once you realize you need to optimize the system, it's not just about each compute device, but optimizing the I.O., in the full interconnect, and pretty soon you're revamping the entire system at a rack scale, which I think is very exciting and will be transformative in the industry. What are the uh, some of the benefits of custom silicon? Well, Gareth, we talked about uh, technology slowing down um, and really the need to increase performance isn't slowing down. So power and performance are really the primary goals to customization. Um, we've seen that different hyperscalers have have said, hey, we've got... 30 plus percent increases in performance per watt when we develop a custom CPU. And it's, you know, that kind of benefit is hard to get, right, from a, from a technology itself. Um, that said, there's a lot of different manifestations of this. Um, you know, we recently, uh, for example, launched an initiative that we announced publicly last week uh, where we're now integrating voltage regulation into the package. And it's an... It's a very um, interesting and unique step towards the optimization, uh, but it allows us to take a power delivery and move it from a really big, complicated board onto the device itself. 
Um, and that actually has some major impacts, right? We can uh, reduce uh, uh, transmission loss uh, through that big giant board. And in fact, we can actually cut down the total uh, IR related transmission loss uh, to 85% less uh, than it used to be. Um, and we can deliver more power into the, into the compute devices themselves, right? Better power delivery allows you to have more compute per rack, uh, which in improves the ROI in the data center. Um, and maybe even more important than those two things, uh, integrating voltage regulation into the module significantly reduces power supply noise, which is really the bane of uh, modern compute systems and, you know, can cause catastrophic failures if they're not really planned for and mitigated. And planning for them and mitigating for them often includes adding extra power uh, to the device. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so not only are we customizing silicon, we're customizing the construction of how those devices are put together. You know, that said, um, there's other factors too, right? Well, we talked about the custom NIC that we um, worked with Meta to develop. The main motivation for that is improved uptime. Right. So if you can build your own product and make sure that your data center is running more smoothly and more efficient and can't have uh, can't have a catastrophic shutdown, um, then it makes total sense to customize and build your own. What parts of a chip actually get to uh, customize? Yeah. So the, the fun thing is really anything. Right. We we talked about uh, even even all the way to uh, the power delivery, which is, you know, something that even used to be on the board, uh, but really any yeah. game. Yep. Computing cores, for example, a really big deal. Um, but, you know, even beyond that, like every element is is possible. The I.O. is getting vastly customized, right? Co-package optics. Uh, there's an element of customization there, right? It, it's happening. Uh, but how we implement it uh, on the chip side can be custom to a certain degree and really optimize the overall system. Um, one of my favorite things, though, from a customization point of view is memory. It can wax philosophical about that if you'd like. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> a few weeks ago, you had your custom AI investor event. There were a number of very interesting announcements. Um, you've already talked about the, the voltage regulator chip. Um, another announcement was about custom SRAM. Um, so you developed the industry's first two nanometer SRAM chip. So can you uh, give us some details about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, as I mentioned, uh, thanks for continuing with one of my favorite topics because uh, memory is definitely one of them. The memory that is actually embedded into the into the chip itself, into the device. Uh, interesting, we usually think about memory as being kind of off-chip. Uh, things like high bandwidth memory for an accelerator or DDR memory. Um, but uh, the on-chip memory is actually uh, as important or perhaps even more important than uh, these external memories. And what we announced last week is that, quite frankly, we've been developing custom SRAM with a with an experienced team for over 25 years at Marvell, um, shared publicly that our custom SRAMs are actually cutting standby power uh, for a lot of these devices, for the SRAM that's inside them, by up to 66%. So 66% less standby power, which is less power that the data center has to plan for. We also can essentially save up to 15% of the total die area as well, because we can just we use a lot more bandwidth out of these devices, out of these embedded SRAMs that, that we provide to our customers. Um, so it's really incredible, right? We create this um, significant chip level, like 15% chip level area is impossible to get any other way. We get this huge benefit from a chip level area at the same time reducing power and at the same time really providing like seven, as we calculated, 17 times the bandwidth per square millimeter uh, to feed the compute engines. Uh, and this is this is activity that we're really pioneering in the latest technology in two nanometers, uh, where we have demonstrated hardware already. Um, so it's pretty pretty exciting. Um, outside of you know embedded SRAM, we also announced last week that we're developing custom HBM, uh, which is that next level of memory connected to the compute device itself. Um, and our custom HBM uses our um, really customized interfaces to reduce the memory interface power by 70%, which is phenomenal. Uh, CXL memory expansion and, and uh, compute devices uh, called Structera uh, can add up to 12 terabytes of DRAM uh, to a server, and we can even add compute cores along with them, uh, which is a phenomenal amount of high-capacity memory. And this is offered either as a customized solution or a merchant product that, that uh, customers can go in and have this increased memory capacity in their systems.
a lot of this custom stuff, of course, is based on chiplets. Um, so does that mean that chiplets are synonymous with custom? Um, in some ways, yes. Uh, when, you know, we spoke a, a little bit about how uh, transistor area scaling is really slowing down, um, which means the chips are inevitably getting larger. Uh, while at one time we could develop a seven nanometer device that might be 600 square millimeters, the equivalent of that, as we look at our needs to increase performance every generation, when we map to a technology like two nanometers, we might need like 3,500 square millimeters of silicon to keep up with the performance scaling requirements from generation to generation. Right now, our reticle or our, our total mask size for a device is limited to about 800 square millimeters, which means there's no, there's no choice but to divide and conquer. We really need to break silicon up into different pieces um, into, you know, 800 square millimeters or smaller, use chiplets, and use advanced packaging to get around the scaling limitations of silicon. Uh, so, for example, we just announced a 2.5D multi-chip package that can hold uh, 2.8 times more compute than the equivalent monolithic chip with the same footprint. Um, so that's a really big deal, using package to really allow more and more silicon to be integrated and still fit in the same footprint of a single uh, monolithic chip. We also, of course, with chiplets, get all the great benefits that we were hoping for years, 10 years ago when we started on this, uh, on this road, uh, where we can increase yields, reduce risks, and cut costs for, for integration. Uh, in fact, chiplets have really started um, blurring the lines uh, for us between packaging and silicon. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Wolfgang Soder, uh, who speaks publicly a lot uh, in the packaging industry, now calls uh, uh, some of these devices chackages, a combination of chip and package, because it's becoming harder to tell uh, where the chip ends and the package begins. I was at the Chiplet Summit uh, in Santa Clara uh, back in January this year. Um, a lot of the people there think that ch a chiplet would completely democratize uh, chip development. Um, but as we've already been discussing, chiplets are not new. They've been around for quite a while. Um, and chip democratization hasn't happened up to now. Um, so, so why not? W what's your take on this? Yeah, yeah. And, in, in, you know, 10 years ago, uh, when, we, when we started uh, down this road, uh, we really saw um, a huge benefit to being able to pull a different chiplet with a different function from a different provider um, and integrate all these things together by essentially just putting them next to each other, wiring them together, and they'll work. Um, that was a noble goal. Um, but what we found um, through actually you know, fo following this path and implementing them is that in many cases to really optimize the system, uh, all of the different chiplets in that system really tie together and are aligned on, you know, kind of one micron of tolerance kind of kind of scale. Um, and it just becomes very difficult um, for, let's say, solving the Lego puzzle of putting the different chiplets together in a system. Uh, that said, one of the things that I've observed uh, over the last year and a half or so um, is that um, we are getting closer to that. We are starting to see uh, chiplets being used on multiple products. Um, and it's, it doesn't happen exactly the same way we thought it would. Um, it's, it's more like uh, the chiplet is driving the specification for uh, the system in a way. You figure, out how to, you figure out what the chiplet needs to support it, and you plan the rest of the system uh, to accommodate it, to plug into it. Um, so I'd say with this, with this advancement, we're getting closer to that ideal goal, right? We're now actually uh, getting a lot of experience in integrating chips together. EDA tools are starting to evolve and help us from a DFT point of view uh, to make these products uh, plug and play and be able to test and yield. Uh, but we have a long way to go. Uh, but, but I'm actually delighted to see that we've made uh, some really good progress over the last year and a half. Okay, I'm afraid time's up. We have to leave it there. Um, but thank you very much indeed, Mark, for a very interesting and very informative discussion. Great. Thank you, Gareth. It's been a pleasure talking with you today.